Which transistor portable radio would you rather have? This one with its tiny speaker? This expensive model that sounds no better? Or the new RCA Victor with really big set sound? And which would you rather have? A radio that uses up 12 batteries or the new RCA Victor transistor radio that uses just three to play the same length of time. Load it once and it can play up to four times longer than other transistor radios for the money. And which would you rather have? These or RCA Victor's new transistor portable in the guaranteed non-breakable impact case. Which would you rather have? An RCA Victor, of course, in three smart colors. RCA Victor's Newsmaker transistors as low as $29.95 at your dealers now. Hey, welcome to an all-new episode of On the Record. And I'll be taking a look at that great swashbuckling silver screen star Errol Flynn with you today. The record is a four disc set featuring Flynn in the role that eluded him on screen. And that being D'Artagnan in Alexander Dumas' adventure classic, The Three Musketeers. But first, I want to give a shout out to subscriber Anthony Perdue, who I am crediting as guest associate producer on this episode of On the Record, because he made an excellent suggestion to me. Um, Anthony uh, commented recently, Hi, Charlie Cat, Juno, Dave, and Dennis. This new series is going to be inter very entertaining. And may I suggest displaying the album covers of each recording addressed. Many album covers of the 1950s through the 1970s had beautiful artwork and photographed scenes. And Anthony, you are 100% right. Um, that was a definite lapse in uh, uh, my work on last week's uh, On the Record. The artwork was absolutely it, it helped make the album in my opinion and one that was uh, the, an album that stands out as an absolute classic for the artwork to me is uh, elton john's captain fantastic and the brown beard cowboys and if you've ever looked at that we'll look at it sometime together on here it's uh, it's fascinating but that was something i should have known to do last time and uh, the three discs i featured were reverend cl franklin uh aretha franklin's dad the queen of soul and uh, there was no cover with the discs, and uh, but I was happy to just get the discs anyways, you know. But um, I'm sure that I could have gone online and found a copy of the cover of the album to use. So I apologize to all of you for that, and I thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, congrats on being the first person to be named as a guest associate producer ever on the Dennis Morrison channel. You are now officially a member of the Dennis Morrison channel and Charlie Cat Productions family and you are all a member of my family. The album that we're going to look at today consists of four 12-inch discs. Uh, they, the cover is, as you can see, is um, an attractive late 1940s style. And while it features a tight headshot of Errol Flynn, the, uh, the white artwork pictures Flynn in costume of the lead musketeer. And at first I wondered why Columbia Records didn't just use a photograph of him in the costume, uh, you know, in actual costume. But as I alluded to in the beginning, Flynn, uh, who was a quintessential, tough word for me to say, <laughs> swashbuckler, and, and he played them all on film, except the greatest of them, D'Artagnan. So uh, there was no photograph they would have had to come up with a costume, which I'm sure they could have done but they use the white artwork instead for whatever reason. Anyways, it works on the cover, it looks good. And uh, <clears throat> there were a number of versions of uh, Three Musketeers made during the period that uh, Flynn could have actually played that role and looked good in that role, but they went to other actors. I don't know, perhaps he was busy with uh, other projects at the time that they came up. But anyways, the dramatized audio version of Dumas' work was presented much in the same manner as, say, the Lux Radio Theater or Screen Guild Theater, um, which was on the radio at that time. It was the entertainment that came into the home. And so this was home entertainment. Um, you didn't go out and 
buy a, a disc or something with a movie on it, but you went out and you could buy the audio uh, story. And they were very popular and they were very well produced. The only thing different really from the uh, uh, those radio programs is that there uh, there was no live audience so there wasn't applause in the background it was but they were fully dramatized and uh, great background music so um, the the uh, the recording was released on the green Columbian masterworks label and the release was adapt was adapted and directed by Ralph Rose now, Mr. Rose later became much in demand in early television, contrib contributing scripts to shows like Hawaii and I, Matinee Theater, The Sheriff of Cochise, as well as The Schlitz Playhouse. The supporting cast included Sanford Bickert as father, Gerald Mayhar as Rockford. Mayer was well known for playing Captain Gilda in the 1946 movie Gilda. And uh, on top of that, Mr. Mayhart also appeared in more than 500 radio plays and 73 movies and 100 TV shows. He, he was, his voice was very um, recognizable to the, to the people at that time. So um, the part of Athos was played by Kenneth Harvey and Porthos was played by Frank Graham, who was well known uh, as a voice actor and his talents were used by Disney uh, MGM, Columbia, and Warner Brothers Studios. Now, here I want to take just a moment and play uh, an excerpt from the disc. I'm going to play the beginning of it. Um, I can't play the whole disc. I believe it's still under copyright. But uh, let's take a listen here. I'll be back in just a second. Greetings, everyone. I'm here to tell you a story. It's an exciting story filled with adventure and intrigue. It happened in France many years ago during the reign of Louis XIII. And it all began one beautiful spring morning when I decided to leave my home, which was located in a small village, and seek my fortune in Paris. Ah, but perhaps I should introduce myself. My name is D'Artagnan. <laughs> My father, like most fathers, hated to see his son leave home, but he understood my desire to make my own way in the world, and gave me what little assistance he could. It was really little enough, 15 crowns, <laughs> that's about two dollars in your money, and a letter of introduction to Richard de Fayville. <clears throat> this was home entertainment at its best from back in the day. Um, I might add that rounding out the cast was Jack Edwards Jr., who was well known for his role in the 1937 film High Hat and The Cross of Lorraine. There really is no way to adapt a book the size of The Three Musketeers and allow the whole story to be told on four, on four 12 inch 78 RPM discs. 78 RPM discs go by quite fast. So um, it, uh, Ralph Rose in adapting this chose the episode of the Queen's Diamond Necklace to base his adaptation on. Now, John Ball Jr. had to, uh, had this to say in the liner notes, or liner, liner notes, excuse me. The Three Musketeers was published in 1844, just over a hundred years ago at the time that he wrote this. Almost at once, the exciting story caught on, so much so that another was, a, a, was obliged to respond with two sequels, uh, 20 years after and 10 years later. So, that's a look at this, uh, this, what is a really classic recording. I don't know that it's ever been re-released on 12-inch uh, LP, um, but uh, if you ever get a chance to listen to the whole thing, it is definitely well worth it, and I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm going to close this out. We're going to do another excerpt from the, uh, from the uh, recording, and I hope you'll enjoy this, and thank you for stopping by. And I'm hoping next week to have a special interview with Bill and Judy from Records and Tapes Galore here in Saginaw. Um, they have consented to let me interview them, and I was going to do that this week, and then we got hit by a snowstorm here and some bitter cold weather. And being that I walk everywhere as that I go, um, that's going to wait probably till next week when the temperatures are supposed to skyrocket up into the low 30s, actually high 30s, 37 on Tuesday. Anyways. Thank you all for stopping by, and I'll see you next week on The Record.
stood outside the door of Richlow's chambers, I could, I could hardly believe my ears. I'd have to kill the queen. <laughs> it appeared I'd had another vision before I could leave the palace. I drew back into the shadows and waited. After several minutes, the man addressed as Rochefort left the room. Then I saw his face, and my heart leapt into my throat. It was the dark man with a scar, the man who'd stolen my letter. <laughs> this time he'd not escape me. He walked quickly down the corridor and started up the stairs towards the Queen's chambers. What was I to do? I was too far away to prevent his ascent, so I unsheathed my sword and threw it at him. It stuck, whirring in the wall. I rushed forward and leapt on him. We rolled down the stairs. He drew his sword. I knocked it from his hand. He ran back, took my sword from the wall and faced me. I picked his blade up from the floor and vanished in my hand. At last, for my revenge, Morgan. Up and down the stairs we fought, over the side, into room after room and out them. Smashing over tables and chairs, we knocked them out of our way. Finally, I fought him step by step to the top of the stairway. And, at last, I locked his sword to his breast and forced him back over the edge of the...